Hi, today I'm going to do something a little bit different from the previous uh, short videos and record a kind of uh, long form essay on this question I've been thinking about because of seeing many comments on uh, social media. And the question is, is Zionism the uh, new form of Nazism? Um, just to get to the chase, I believe it's not. However, both these ideologies have something in common, which I think is very useful to explore and keep in mind as we think about what is going on and as we oppose this descent into a genocidal um, collapse of uh, the Zionist project and Israel in general. So both Zionism and Nazism are ideologies that are rooted in 19th century nationalism. But, you know, that's not excluded. You could say, make an argument that Palestinian nationalism is also rooted in 19th century uh, nationalism and in this sense, uh, somewhat um, contemporary to uh, the emergence of, you know, other forms of nationalism of which uh, Zionism is one. Uh, what I think both Zionism and Nazism and other forms of, uh, as we'll see, uh, Western uh, ideologies have in common is something they share with um, Western so-called civilization. I'm saying so-called civilization because I'm always thinking of this uh, famous uh, Gandhi response when asked by a British journalist, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? Gandhi answered, I think it would be a really good idea. I also think Western civilization would be a really good idea if it eventually uh, civilized itself, if you like. <clears throat> what both Zionism and Nazism share is a cultural supremacism based at the end of the day on you know some notion of whiteness, European whiteness. In other words, they share the idea that Western culture, such as it historically emerged in uh, Europe, is inherently superior to all other past or present cultures. So Western culture, Western supremacism, of course, uh, conquered the world, you know, and has been uh, pretty much controlling the whole globe for the past 500 years. And two things really made this conquest possible. The first one, an essential one, was technological dominance, technological supremacy. Now, technological dominance actually wasn't unique to um, Western culture. The Chinese had technological supremacy as well. And they, in fact, built an armada and started traveling the world. They visited between 1405 and 1433, Southeast Asia, South Asia, West Asia, and Africa, and traded with uh, the folks that they met, and then came back. Interestingly, the Chinese armada was um, led by Admiral Zheng He, who uh, came from a Muslim family. And when the Chinese armada came back, the next emperor decided he wasn't that interested in uh, traveling the world. And that was the end of the great uh, Chinese exploration. So that was even before, uh, before 1491 and the uh, conquest of discovery, as Europeans like to think of it, of, uh, of America. <clears throat> so the difference is, in fact, Chinese civilization wasn't supremacist. 
So after trading, they went back, never thought to impose their civilization outside their near borders and never in a <clears throat> genocidal way. Western supremacist colonialists were able to conquer the world thanks to their own technological supremacy, which technological supremacy only increased as they were able to develop capitalism on basically the exploitation of natural resources of faraway lands and the enslavement of <clears throat> indigenous populations. Hmm. Of the global south, right? And uh, along with their material superiority that afforded this technological supremacy, came this very distinct feature of Western culture, supremacism. And settler colonies, such as, for example, in Argentina, in North America, in what would become the US or Canada, were necessarily supremacist. What do I mean by that? Well, to build a national projects, they needed to erase the indigenous population, its culture, its way of life. They could not coexist with them. They could not integrate into them. They had to erase them. And the justification for that was a supremacist ideology, which of course rested on the very evident at the time, technological supremacy. The same applies to the late, latest comer uh, to the settler colonial game, if you like, being the Zionist settler colonial project. Just to be clear, Zionism from its very inception and in the text of its founding fathers saw itself as a colonial project. It openly talked about colonizing Palestine and that's the way it thought of itself. And it also came with this idea that the Western culture, the Western way of life was superior to the indigenous population. And sometimes this was taken as justification for colonizing, you know, uh, making the desert bloom, for example, and also a justification for getting rid of the population, sometimes not seeing it, not seeing it, land without people, for people without land, or if there was indeed a people, as many as I miss, were aware, just finding ways, whether violent or whether non-violent, whether by trade or whatever, but finding ways of emptying the land of the native population, the native culture, and the native indigenous way of life. <clears throat> white supremacy is based on this idea that non-whites are inferior to such an extent that their humanity actually doesn't register, doesn't count as much. And indigenous people simply do not count, do not count amongst the humans that really count. They are essentially other from us, but not just different, but other in fundamentally, inherently inferior way. And this is at the root of Western European white supremacy, call it what you want. And it's baked into every single white supremacist ideology and colonial project. Germany, like all the other uh, capitalist white supremacist nations, was a colonial empire that came together with its capitalistic development in the 18th and 19th century. And it extracted, like all the others, resources and enslaved nations with absolutely no regard for the humanity of their indigenous population. If we look at what Europe visited on Africa, it's millions upon millions of people killed not necessarily because uh, the colonials wanted to kill them, but simply because they were treated as animals, objects, dispensable things that, you know, 
we could kill and treat in however barbarous ways because they were just not human or not as human as were white European colonies. And um, in fact, Germany has this particular distinction of having on its record, if you like, on its charge sheet, the first genocide of the 20th century. At the time, Germany had colonized um, southwestern Africa. And which was, you know, the indigenous population, there was the Herero and Nama peoples. They didn't take that kindly to being colonized by the Germans and they revolted. And in one incident, they killed 123 German soldiers, settlers, and even some women. No doubt the German colonials saw them as, saw that episode as incredibly barbaric, as savage, as something that could not be left without a very strong response. And so they embarked on the first genocide of the 20th century. They pushed the uh, Hebrew people in the desert where they died of hunger and thirst. And then they rounded up the survivors in concentration camps. So you have here a picture of those concentration camps, even in one death camp. And you see here another picture of the camp itself. It looks quite a lot like uh, what uh, Palestine, you know, the camps that now, the 10 camps that the Palestinians in Gaza are now forced to live in, and in which they still get bombed, by the way. Who ran Southwestern um, Africa for the Germans at the time? Well, it was someone called, um, I have his name, Heinrich Ernst Goering. So he's the one who effectively conducted this first genocide of the 20th century on behalf of Imperial Germany. By the end of it, 90% of the the Herero population had been exterminated and 50% of the Nama population. Oh, and you know this Goering governor? Anzati was the father of Hermann Goering, one of the main leaders of Nazi Germany. The creator of the Nazi Gestapo, the Nazi secret police that uh, visited the uh, untold torture and surveillance on the whole of the um, German population in occupied countries also, and a convicted war criminal at Nuremberg. And that's kind of interesting, isn't it, right? Interestingly, Namibia just spoke yesterday about Germany's reaction to South Africa bringing Israel in front of the International Court of Justice on charges of genocide. You may know that Germany publicly declared that it would stand up as a third party to reject the baseless accusations of genocide against Israel. So here is what the president of Namibia had to say yesterday about Germany, Germany's move. And I'll read a little bit of it. Of it. Namibia rejects Germany's support of the genocidal intent of the racist Israeli state against innocent civilians in Gaza. On Nab Namibian soil, Germany committed the first genocide of the 20th century in 1904, 1908, in which tens of thousands of innocent Namibians died in the most inhuman and brutal conditions. The German government is yet to fully atone for the genocide it committed on Namibian soil. Therefore, in light of Germany's inability to draw lessons from its horrific history, President A.J. Gengob expresses, I hope I pronounced that right, expresses deep concern 
with the shocking decision communicated by the government of the Federal Republic of Germany yesterday, January 2024, in which it rejected the morally upright indictment brought forward by South Africa before the International Court of Justice that Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. So that's really interesting. You know, the descendants of the victims of the first genocide of the 20th century perpetrated by the German Empire, calling out Germany today when it stands up to defend Israel against charges of genocide being brought by South Africa which is a country that knows a thing or two about apartheid and institutionalized racism, right? But really, there was nothing special about Germans. That genocidal colonial horror was visited by Europeans all over the world. And in Africa, just as much, in particular, beginning of the century, the turn of the 20th century, in the Congo, where the king of Belgium himself was the personal owner of Congo, and millions of Congolese were killed, died, tortured, their limbs amputated when they didn't produce enough rubber for the plantations of the king. And it's not as if Western society didn't know. I mean, clearly there wasn't, you know, uh, social media and real-time filming of the genocide as we're having today in Gaza. But, you know, here's a caricature from the um, English satirical magazine Punch, in which you can see a native being strangled by a snake who uh, has the head of the, uh, the king of Belgium. So people in the West knew about the genocidal nature of colonialism, even then. So, there's nothing special about Germany. As far as Western civilization is concerned, genocides are us. In fact, by the turn of the 20th century, one of the most prolific forms of white supremacy and racist ideology was the United States of America, which by then had pretty much uh, completed its successful genocide of the native peoples of the US, as well as, you know, managed to keep the once enslaved black population in a very inferior and exploited place, which very largely it still lives in to this day. So it's kind of unsurprising that Germany gave way to Nazism. But let's look a little bit more at what is Nazism, where it comes from. Today, it's presented as this essentially anti-Semitic movement. It was that, of course but it was first and foremost an imperialist and anti-socialist movement. Hitler himself found inspiration in Western imperialism, was a great admirer of British imperialism, and also found inspiration in American racist pseudoscience and the eugenist movement, which we'll look at a little bit in more detail. He was also violently anti-communist and anti-Bolshevik. Many in Germany uh, blamed the defeat of Germany in World War I on communist socialist agitation. And in fact, as the vanquished power in World War I, which was essentially a conflict between competing European imperialism, German and the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire on one side, and the uh, British imperialists allied with the French imperialists on the other side, with a little bit of participation towards the end by the emerging 
um, U.S. empire that wasn't really installed yet, not as a colonial empire, largely. And when Germany lost, well, they lost their empire. They lost their uh, colonies. And so Hitler's big idea was to continue or revive German imperialism. By the way, Third Reich means the Third Empire. So that gives you uh, an idea into the imperialist nature of the project by expanding East. You don't have colonies in the global South anymore because those were all taken up by the French and British imperialists. So the idea was let's expand East. One of the problems with that is that East, you had this extremely large country, the uh, Soviet Union, the USSR, which was even bigger than uh, Russia is today, and of course was the seat of the first successful communist revolution. And so, there's another thing about this communist revolution, the Bolshevik revolution, as they were called in the uh, USSR, is that a very large number of the Bolshevik leaders of that revolution were actually Jewish. Some of them proudly Jewish, possibly because, you know, the Jewish people had been persecuted and exploited. And also it is, I think, part of the Jewish philosophy to be on the side of the oppressed, to be for social justice. So the socialist, the communist movement was attractive to Jewish people. And that's how many Jewish people found themselves leading the first successful communist revolution. That, of course, fed a new form of anti-Semitism, which was very much conflating Jewish people and Bolshevism. And in fact, this is a poster from a 1919 US film on which you can see the uh, a caricature of a person that looks very much like Trotsky, the most famous Jewish leader of the uh, Bolshevik revolution. Behind him is this uh, spider web, you know, a very well-known uh, anti-Semitic trope and uh, is threatening the healthy white uh, American worker and that anti-Semitism was part of the anti-communist propaganda from the very beginning. This is a poster from the times of the civil war in the Soviet Union that broke out after the communist revolution. And by the way, the US, the English and the French did try and invade the Soviet Union on the side of, uh, of the counter-revolutionaries. And you see here again, being used anti-Semitic tropes with, again, the figure of Trotsky, the uh, bloody, blood uh, thirsty uh, Jew, right? So Hitler was steeped into that idea. A lot of Hitler's anti-Semitism thus stems from his anti-communism and found echo in his earlier anti-Semitic tropes. As a, an aspiring young artist in Vienna, where he was born and raised in Austria, he said, and I'm quoting now from the great review of Mein Kampf by uh, Joe Emmonsberger that you can find on Red Cells. I will put the link in the, in the description. Hitler wrote, my eyes were open to two perils, the names of which I scarcely knew hitherto and had no notion whatsoever of their terrible significance for the existence of the German people. These two perils were Marxism and Judaism. Because Hitler was so steeped in race science, he could only understand Marxism under the prism of race and the anti-Semitism as Marx himself was the son of a converted Jew who himself was the son of a rabbi. And to race pseudoscience, what you're not Jews, 
because of your religion or your culture, you're Jewish because of your blood, because of your actual ancestors. So communism, Marxism was necessarily Jewish to racists like Hitler. And in fact, you'll still find this on the internet. Some people will tell you that the Bolshevik Revolution is actually a Jewish plot because you know it had so many uh, Jewish leaders in the Bolshevik Revolution. But note that if Hitler absolutely hated Jews, he also admired their intelligence and what he saw as their cunning, another anti-Semitic trope, by the way. That said, when he looked at what he saw as other races and, for example, black people, he considered Africans as dogs. He even used that, you know, when Africans uh, able to ascend to the professions, lawyer, doctors, or whatever, they do so in a way that is akin to training circus tricks in dogs. So that gives you an idea of the hierarchy of races that someone like Hitler and Nazi ideology actually was based on, right? Um, <clears throat> And as for other white imperialists, as we said, he admired American settlers as well as the British colonialists. And he hoped to eventually have them, the British imperialists, as kind of subservient allies. Pretty much in the same way as today, the British imperialists are subservient allies, sidekicks to US imperialists. Um, Central to Hitler was, oh, yeah. Essential to Hitler was race, science, and eugenics, right? Uh, I have some, yeah, things I want to show you on that. So, this is from American pseudo race science. You know, they identified four races Caucasian on the right, Negroes what they call them, Mongolian, and then American Indian. Needless to say, there was a hierarchy, and on top of the hierarchy were the Caucasians. I mean, that Caucasian notion is itself pseudoscientific, but it's so baked in American ideology that even today, American white people will describe themselves and write on their documents that they are Caucasians. That language is still used in today's America. So, Race science was essential and eugenics. We talked a little bit earlier about eugenics. If race science is essential to you, if you have a hierarchy of races and some races are superior, it follows that it is a social duty to preserve the purity of the race. So eugenics is based on this. You know, We should grow a pure human race in the same way as you try to grow better vegetables, right? And that there are some people born to be a burden on the rest, as one of the uh, you know eugenic uh, pamphlets, US pamphlets of the turn of the 20th century would say. And this eugenic idea was so strong, there was a strong movement that you could even get a eugenic certificate that guaranteed that you had a perfect physical and mental balance and you were unusually strong in terms of eugenic love possibilities, that you were well fitted to promote the happiness and future welfare of the race. And that welfare of the race idea was absolutely central to Nazism and Hitler ideology, right? And um, so you had to eliminate all menaces to that. Right of the race. And in fact, the first targets of elimination of the Nazis weren't Jewish. They were the members of the superior race that were, you know, a danger to weaken the race. And, you know, the Nazis elaborated on the Caucasian. They had decided that the Aryans were the best. And then you had all sorts of mixed races like the Slavs, which were mixed with the um, 
Mongolians, the Asians, and you couldn't have any of that, and you had to really keep the master race and all the others would be slave races. But first you had to keep the master race, so you had to eliminate also all inside threats. So disabled people would be um, sterilized, would be eliminated, and in fact also uh, people with different mental functioning, you know, in particular autistic people. So that's personal to me. And uh, one of the first uh, psychiatrists who described um, what's known as high functioning autism and for a long while was called Asperger, was Dr. Hans Asperger, was an Austrian doctor who was tasked by the Nazis to separate between autistic folks, those that would be eliminated and those that could maybe survive. And that was a central part of Nazi ideology. The other part was to just go and enslave populations to the East, enslave the Jewish population, enslave the Slav population. And uh, they had to be enslaved because they were inferior in the same way as the same and thinking way as Africans, Asians, Native Americans had been inferior and had to be enslaved. So one important point is that for Nazis, you had to enslave them rather than eliminate them to impose your own culture. But there was also an element of you know, settler colonialism in the sense that they really wanted to colonize the east of Europe. So Nazi project, crazy and evil, for sure, but actually not miles away from mainstream Western supremacism and what that mainstream Western supremacism had done to the non-white world for centuries. Amy Césaire was a French writer, oh, it's not French, excuse me, uh, French writer and poet of French expression, coming from Martinique, who was a French colony, still is in the West Indies, who wrote about the colonial mindset. And he wrote this very famous discourse on colonialism in 1950, and in which he said that Europeans were not shocked by genocide, by the genocide of the Nazis per se, and the proof of that is right after the collapse of Nazism. The French, for example, went massacring tens of thousands of people in Algeria, that's in 1945, in Madagascar, later in uh, Vietnam. No, it was the fact that the Nazis had treated Europeans in the same way that Europeans had been treating the, rest, treating the rest of the world. And that was the thing that was really shocking to Europeans, not the racism, not the genociding, not the supremacism, simply the fact that it had been visited on Europeans and the same techniques also and violence had been visited on European societies. But what Aimé Césaire said, and I think he had a point is that Hitler lives inside each and every white supremacist, no matter their colors. So you could understand it is to mean that all white supremacists are Nazis or that Nazis are just one form of white supremacies turned on white populations and for the purpose of you know in terms of European culture, Jews were separate, persecuted many times, but they were still an integral part of European culture, integral part of European literature, European thought, European science. 
and uh, that's very interesting point that Mrs. A is making there and is also pointing to another thing, which is that there is something baked into white supremacism that eventually will make it turn in on itself. And that's when white supremacists become little Hitlers and start being fascistic, not just to brown people in faraway lands, but to their own populations or certain identified groups of their own population, which by the way, could be identified in religious terms or in cultural or even in political terms. Right? And that's why you get you know, political fascism, when, which can happen even without being racist, right? Another thing about uh, Nazism that I think is uh, interesting to note is that Hitler and Nazism were highly modernist and super high-tech. They sought alliances with Western and US capital. They used the best of Western psychological propaganda techniques by then really uh, emerging uh, emergent in the US, it's also known as advertising. And um, they lied all the time. Well, they lied all the time. They lied and they lied and they lied and they lied. And sometimes people say, you design is lying, they lie and they lie and they lie. And their lies are just as big as the Nazis. So that makes them Nazis. Guys, the US has been lying and lying and lying since forever. Every single war that you the US got into was based on the lie later debunked. Big lies, I mean, it's a very big lie that will get you into a war, isn't it? So lying and lying and lying is just what Western supremacist governments do. Nothing special there, nothing particularly Nazi about that. And uh, also, you know, the Nazis clearly, deliberately put themselves into the context of European culture. Let me show you that poster of this exhibition in occupied Paris organized by the, by the Nazis. And international uh, exhibition, please visit Bolshevism against Europe. So you see the idea there is that there is this menace against uh, European um, civilization. And this you still find even in, you know, in, in old white supremacist ideology. Today, the threat isn't Bolshevism anymore since the, uh, the end of the Soviet Union. It's turned into Islamism, right? Or sometimes they call it, uh, what do they call it in uh, leftist uh, Muslim or whatever. But the general idea is all oh, white civilization is threatened by these guys. I wanted to show you a few pictures that I missed earlier of how the Nazis really conflated anti-Semitism with anti-communism, anti-Bolshevism. So you see here a Nazi poster saying, Bolshevism without masks and with the um, star of David, right? And another one that says uh, Bolshevism is Jewish, uh, Jewishness, right? And this very uh, famous, um, popular Nazi film uh, about this, uh, I think, The Wandering Jew, I think it was called. And you see here all the um, anti-Semitic tropes, the big nose, the money. Uh, and then in the other hand, it's got this uh, communist Russia. So Judeo-Bolshevism was one of the main target of this Nazi ideology. Let's look at Zionism now. It shares, of course, white supremacist ideological origins with Nazism and roots in race science. I mean, even the term anti-Semitic comes from race science. You know, in the 19th century, that was pseudo race science identified as one of the races, Semites. Semites came from Western Asia and, you know, Jewish people in the uh, religious idea. I don't know if genetically, you know, the Ashkenazi population comes from there, but comes from 
Southwest Asia. So they're Semites and anti-Jewish hate was rebranded anti-Semitism, which is itself based in race ideology rather than just calling it anti-Jewish hate, which is what it's been and continues to be. Nazis, uh, Zionist, sorry, is a fruit from the same supremacist tree as Nazis. But actually, I think it's closer to American settler colonialism than to Nazi ideology. It's more like you know, the American exceptionalist. We have this manifest destiny. We need to settle this land. And the indigenous population that were there before are illegitimate for some reason that you know the construction of the reason kind of changes over time it has changed uh, in zionism what, becoming more religious over time and it has changed also in the us but it has to be disappeared that um, indigenous population right um i think zionism doesn't necessarily see arabs as a race to be enslaved much less exterminated but it sees Arabs as fundamentally inferior in all ways. And, you know, basically less than human, less than human in the sense that they don't have the same rights. For example, they don't have the right of self-determination on the land of Palestine because only Zionists and that, you know. Zionism also relies on Orientalism. You know, this is a concept um, developed by the Palestinian scholar Edward Said, which basically showed that in Western imagination, Orientals are always, since a few, the past two or three centuries, portrayed as less civilized, more brutal, more boorish, more dishonest, that they are ruled by baser instincts, including centrally sexual ones that make them lust uncontrollably after white women and rape them whenever they get the chance. And this Orientalism, by the way, explains why allegations of mass rapes against Hamas are so easily accepted by the Western public, even absent solid evidence of such mass rapes that you know, we're still waiting to see. We don't know if it was there, but it strikes the Orientalist imagination because at the end of the day, brown people lust sexually after white women. The same phenomenon, of course, uh, underline a lot of the uh, racism in, in the US, right? Um, so the, these are tropes that Zionism shares with uh, white supremacist ideology, even more than with Nazism in general. And they are so deeply ingrained in the Western mind that we in the West, we've been spoon fed this stuff from birth. And we don't even realize that we are afflicted by it. In a way, white supremacist functions a little bit like a personality disorder. The folks afflicted by it don't see it, don't realize they have it. It's only the folks they interact with that suffer from it and see it. Also, Zionism originally is a much broader ideological field than Nazism, and it remains so to this day. Originally, it had strong, a strong left wing, much like, in fact, the Western left, which is progressive, sometimes even socialistic with respect to how their own uh, nationals, their own national uh, working class is treated, but is perfectly happy to see conditions of the workers of the home nation improved on the back of resource extraction and labor exploitation in colonized countries and populations. Uh, Zionism, therefore, unlike 
Nazism is not inherently anti-socialist or anti-communist in as much as its socialism or communism does not in any way turn anti-colonial. It has historically contained a strong democratic tradition, which is to be commended is a good thing, right? With free expression and right of assembly, a multi-party system, but again, always within the confines of a structural, racial, ethnic, colonial majority. Ben Gurion, the, uh, one of the founders and first prime minister of Israel was obsessed by the demographic question and wanted an 80% Jewish majority in the state of Israel, which was a problem at partition because the partition plan, which gave 55%, I think of uh, mandate Palestine to a Jewish state. By the way, the uh, Palestinian population was never consulted on that plan, which might explain why they refused it. Well, in that majority of Palestinian land that was given for a Jewish state, the Jewish majority, even after all the refugees that come from Eastern Europe after the Holocaust, was only 55%. So there was, from the beginning, a need for ethnic cleansing because you couldn't have a democratic society. It was too risky, especially because then, as now, the indigenous population has a higher birth rate than does the uh, settler colonial population. And that's why, by the way, um, ethnic cleansing started even before the declaration of independence and the refusal of um, Arab countries around, you know, now Israeli historians themselves accept that 350,000, half of the population, the Palestinian population expelled and the creation of Israel was expelled before the declaration of independence. And another thing that's really interesting is, by the way, the ethnic cleansing was conducted just as enthusiastically by forces that came from the nominal left of the Zionist movement, Haganat, or forces that came from the right, such as, you know, Lehi and the uh, Stern uh, gang. But that has also been a central contradiction at the heart of the Zionist and Israeli project, that contradiction between an ethno ethnic definition of citizenship and democracy between a Jewish state and a democratic state. That never bothered Nazism, right? Because at birth, it was in essence an undemocratic project. Um, over time, and especially due to the occupation of the remaining of um, Mandate Palestine in 1967, Zionism has increasingly moved towards apartheid. Well, because with the uh, population of the rest of uh, Palestine, there was not anymore a structural Jewish majority. In fact, today, there isn't a structural Jewish majority in the whole of Palestine, Gaza, West Bank, and 1948 Palestine. Indigenous Palestinians are close to having a majority. So you can't have that. And this is why you have to have this system of permanent occupation apartheid in the West Bank. And uh, why also you have to have this colonization, these illegal settlements promoted all the time so as to make living conditions impossible for Palestinian society, so as to make the very continuation of Palestinian society such as it is, indigenous society such as it is, impossible. And that in itself is already genocidal, not in the sense of exterminating people, but in the sense of making it impossible for a population to continue living in its indigenous way on its indigenous land, which I think is the essence of what genocide is about. It's not some kind of madness where you want to exterminate people for the sake of it. In settler colonial projects, it's about land. 
it's about imposing your functioning on an indigenous society and culture. And you do this, why? Because you are so convinced that your way of doing is superior because you are, at the end of the day, a white European supremacist. And um, what's very interesting is that this means that resistance doesn't need to be violent. If the Palestinian population somehow survives, continues to live on the land and even expands demographically, that in itself is a threat. And this is why the occupation is getting more and more violent, not because of Palestinian violent resistance, but because it's impossible for the supremacist project to maintain itself in the presence of a functioning indigenous society. Another difference with Nazism is the fact that Nazism rose and collapsed pretty quickly, actually, you know, it was in power only 12 years. And between the time it first emerged as an ideology in its demise, 1919 to 1945 was only 26 years and only in power from 33 to 45. That's 12 years. And of course, 12 years is not enough to completely raise a fully Nazi society, which means that in fact, in Nazi Germany, the buying to Nazi ideology was not as great as that. One of the reasons why the Nazis had to hide a lot of what they were doing because they didn't want to shock a population that hadn't been uh, socialized, that hadn't been uh, propagandized, that hadn't been raised in this uh, genocidal mindset. In contrast, Zionism first emerged in 1897 and led to the creation of Israel in 1948 and occupied the remainder of Mandate Palestine in 1967. So over 125 years of history altogether as an ideology, 75 years as a state and 56 years of occupation. That means that Zionist ideology is much more deeply ingrained into Israeli society than Nazi ideology ever could dream of being in German society. And uh, what we are, and this is why we are today seeing overwhelming majorities of Israelis in favor of the Gaza genocide, with actually a priority wanting it to be harder, more violent, and very large majorities also in favor of ethnic cleansing, of simply pushing the 2.3 million Palestinian population of Gaza out of the land in one way or another. And the way doesn't matter so much. I mean, some would want to do it in voluntary, nonviolent ways, but others just don't care because the objective, and this is shared throughout the spectrum of Zionist ideology from the most liberal to the most fascistic wings is to get rid of the indigenous population and the indigenous society. In fact, in Israel, the dehumanization of the indigenous Palestinian and their society is ingrained, ingrained and baked into the whole of society. It's in the education system. There's some great work has been done by Nurit Pellet Elahan on how Palestinians appear in school books, well, basically as shepherds or terrorists. But Israelis can grow up knowing absolutely nothing of Palestinian life and culture. Then in teenagers, they are socialized into the history of the Holocaust. That unspeakable, unthinkable crime of 
extermination on an industrial scale that was perpetrated on the Jewish population. And that gives a sense of national eternal victimhood at the heart of Zionist identity. And, you know, it was there from the beginning because Zionism was this idea that because you could never cure uh, Europe of anti-Semitism, you just had to create your own national state so as to be safe. And with the Holocaust on top of that was a vindication of the Zionist idea. And it's now an essential part of Israeli Jewish consciousness. And it's an important one and one that is in many ways valid. And we'll look at it more a little bit later. And finally, this is all rounded off by service in the army, which men and women alike do, which especially since 67, socialize, socializes everybody in the realities of imposing an apartheid state and makes everybody complicit. How does it work? Well, since 1967, the process of managing this occupation and trying to keep, you know, Zionist supremacy on the state has fed an inexorable rightward shift as forewarned by one of the um, main intellectuals, public intellectuals in Israel by name of uh, Yeshayahu uh, Leibovitz, who one, that the occupation would turn Israel into uh, a copy of what had been visited upon them by, uh, by the Germans, right? And because most Israeli, when they serve in the IDF, they become complicit in the occupation and the imposition of this apartheid occupation regime the West Bank, not many people know the details of it, but it's absolutely incredible. So many checkpoints, so many walls uh, that are imposed on the Palestinian population. You know, you can barge into their houses at night. They are thinned. It's in a minute unimaginable the level of daily oppression visited on the Palestinian population in, in the West Bank. <clears throat> and how and why do human beings, normal human beings, which uh, Israelis are, go along with that? And I think there is where the victimhood that is at the heart of Zionist ideology plays its part. Because when socialized into the immense crime of the Holocaust, and there are, you know, trips organized to visit Auschwitz for um, Israeli teenagers. What comes with this is the idea that as the worst possible crime has been committed on your people, it kind of desensitizes and blocks empathy for any past, present, or future suffering of anyone else and in particular, the indigenous Palestinian population. There's a great uh, documentary by the Israeli filmmaker, uh, Yohav Shamir, called Defamation. You get the link in the description, which follows a group of young Israelis uh, to Auschwitz. And, and they just say, one just said it. She says, oh, no, you know, when I see a house destroyed on television, it's nothing, it's nothing compared to what the Jewish population of Europe was subjected to. And this means that you're already desensitized and you do occupation and now you do genocide, but it's nothing because of the suffering that has been visited on your people. Also, Zionism shares with Nazism a fascination for the application of technological progress to impose its oppression. It's like, in some sense, the most advanced 
white European supremacist society, right? The high tech nation, the startup nation, it's developed the most high tech technologies for surveillance and defense technology. And it sells it around the world as battle tested on Palestinians. And that, the fact that this is so consubstantial to Zionist and Israeli national myth and identity that you know, we control technology, which remember is one of the two pillars of white supremacy, colonialism, white supremacy and technological supremacy. Well, the fact that on the 7th of October, the Palestinian fighters were able to breach and defeat that most high-tech of all separation barriers with sensors on the ground, over drones, or over Gaza all the time, computers, artificial intelligence, the fact that they were able to defeat this, roundly defeat it, I think is at the heart of the profound humiliation that Israeli society has experienced. The massacres that we don't actually know if the civilians, the majority of the civilians were not, in fact, killed by the Israeli army, but are part of it. But I think a very large part of it is suddenly the myth of technological superiority collapsed. One of the two pillars of white supremacist colonialism. And so it would make a lot of sense that in response to one of the two pillars collapsing, many Israelis from the top to the bottom of society, as we can see, you know, listening to their politicians or looking at uh, Israeli citizens on TikTok or IDF soldiers <clears throat> went to grasp the first pillar being white supremacy. This is why we've seen, I believe, this explosion in racist and supremacist sentiment on the part of Israelis, which makes and you know make people think of Nazis, but I believe it's still different. So, in conclusion, I believe it's unhelpful to call Zionist Nazism for a number of reasons, of which I will give just three now. First, <clears throat> whereas the Nazis, as all white supremacists conducting genocide before them, saw themselves as acting in self-defense, just as the Zionists do today, The Nazis did not see themselves as the eternal victims and that the dehumanizing of others was not rooted in deep trauma. In fact, the Nazis saw themselves as the natural top dogs of the world, which were temporarily inconvenienced or you know, shifted a little bit from their position because of treason, treacherous maneuvers during World War I, but they were naturally and forever this you know, warrior race and born to dominate. So that's a very different thing in a sense, right? And uh, we need to always keep in mind that a lot of Zionist identity is based on trauma, on experience of anti-Semitism and since the Holocaust, on the trauma of the Holocaust, and be very also aware of how the dehumanizing that is baked into Zionist ideology is fed by that trauma more than by you know an innate sense of superiority, regardless of what you might have read about you know Jews being the chosen people and all the rest of it. I think it's different on that front. Second. Whereas the uh, racial supremacism of Zionist is just as deeply ingrained as that of the Nazis or any other white uh, supremacist society for that matter, it is much less explicit and much less a conscious part of national identity. 
like most Israelis and Zionists don't go around thinking we're the master race, everybody else is inferior to us. Like, you know, when they meet people in the street, don't go inferior, superior, inferior, superior. The way Nazis openly, explicitly, and even train themselves to do, I don't think that is what's going on there. So I think it's unhelpful to declare them the same because it misses the actual experience of being a Zionist. And which is much more implicit in a way, right? In, in terms of its supremacy, it means further. And, and the fact that it's implicit means that it can coexist with lots of liberal ideas, which is of course not the case for explicit supremacism. And also it misses the fact that they are ideologically much closer to mainstream Western culture than the Nazis were. They are not a break from mainstream Western culture. Not seeing this will make us miss why many in the West identify so readily with Zionists. And you know, I don't believe it's because there is a Jewish plot to manipulate our minds as actual Nazis might actually claim. And the third point I want to make is that Nazis saw themselves as imperialist top dogs. Whereas I don't think Zionist ideology is about being the imperialist top dog, not at all. It's more about integrating the arc of imperialism without necessarily wanting to become the rulers of the empire. Client, servant, supporters, counselors, of course, because they are part of the general white supremacist empire, but rulers of the empire, absolutely not. I don't think it's in the ideology so far as I know. And uh, I think that pretty content to operate symbiotically with US imperialism, maybe some other imperialism if it was to emerge, but it's really a mistake to imagine that they want or even could run the empire by themselves. And Let's note that imagining that would also be a Nazi adjacent or, you know, at the very least, a clearly anti Semitic thing. So, are Zionists the new Nazis? No. Unless all Western white supremacists are Nazis, all Europeans are Nazis, as uh, Amos Cesar suggested, like there is a little Hitler inside each and every one of us. And it could well be the case, but that doesn't make Zionist and Nazis, it makes all of us, not even the new Nazis, the old Nazis, that can turn into the new Nazis when the conditions obtain. And this is pretty much what is going on in Israel today. The conditions have obtained, and now the old society is turning genocidal against the indigenous population, not just in Gaza, by the way. Look at what's going on in the West Bank. There is a very clear offensive to make life impossible for the people in the West Bank to destroy infrastructure, roads, and uh, visit untold violence. So as to inspire them to voluntarily leave because you, as a supremacist ideology, you cannot coexist or integrate with an indigenous culture because that would be recognizing that all people's cultures are equal in humanity and in rights, which I hope is soon recognized in the whole of Israel, Palestine. So I hope this was helpful, I don't know, useful, interesting to some. For me, it's really uh, helpful to uh, share my thoughts out loud without pouring anyone who doesn't want to listen to them. So, and I'll see you in a future video.